Hi, welcome to Chapter 5. We're going to take an in-depth look at the prosecutor. So a prosecutor really is the government's representative in prosecuting cases. It is a very complex position because what you'll find is that the prosecutor has a lot of discretion. And because they have a lot of discretion, a prosecutor also has to have very high ethical standards. Otherwise, you know, they might uh, go awry, so to speak. And prosecutors sometimes have conflicting roles. So we're gonna go ahead and get into what a prosecutor is and what their job is a little deeper. Let's talk about the history and the evolution of the American prosecutor. You know, prosecution stems, at least American prosecution stems from England and from the British system. The British system had an attorney general where a state actor was appointed to represent the interests of the state in prosecuting people for crimes. In the United States, the Judiciary Act of 1789 established an executive appointment, meaning that the executive branch could appoint their own top or head attorney. Then in the 1820s, you started to see a move away, at least in the states, away from appointed prosecutors to elected prosecutors. And in many, in many counties across the country today, most prosecutors are elected and they run for the most part, most of them have um, party elections. So they run as either a Democrat, Independent or Republican. The federal prosecutor Okay, so the federal prosecution team is composed of the U.S. attorney at the top. Each district has a U.S. attorney appointed by the president and confirmed by the Senate. And you will have one U.S. attorney, so the head U.S. attorney, for each of the 93 dis federal districts. They are appointed for four-year terms, and typically they are replaced with the new president. So when President Whenever we have a new president, if the party changes, like you go from Democrat to Republican or Republican to Democrat, uh, typically those that are those U.S. attorneys that are in place will lose their job and someone from the newly elected party will be appointed. U.S. attorneys have hired attorneys to help them do their job, and those are assistant U.S. attorneys. Uh, they can have anywhere for up to 100, in some jurisdictions even more, assistant U.S. attorneys to help them. These are the worker bees that carry out the day-to-day -day operations. Um, once they are, they are hired positions and they are hired government positions. So they are on the federal pay scale. A lot of them do make a career out of it and, t and end up retiring from the federal government. These positions typically are nonpartisan. Like I said, these are your worker attorneys. These are your line attorneys. State prosecutors, um, for the most part, are full-time attorneys. They are, they are employed by the state or the county. And if you look at this chart, you can kind of see what their what their annual budget is, which is kind of cool. Cook County, Illinois, Chicago, their state prosecution office has a $126 million yearly budget. And if you look at it, they have a little over 1,800 full-time staff, close to 900 attorneys. Just to give you a little bit of perspective, here in El Paso, the district attorney's office has about 100 attorneys. So you can see the, the amount of attorneys that it takes to prosecute crimes in Chicago for a population of about uh, five and a half million. Whereas here in El Paso, I, and you know, I'm not sure what our last census was, but I think we were somewhere around 800,000. So that's pretty on par, but go ahead and take a look at that chart. It's pretty interesting. State prosecutors, most state prosecutors are their local prosecutors. They are headed by a district attorney who is elected to a four-year term. And 
El Paso recently elected its very first female district attorney ever. So that's pretty neat precedent. Uh, these district attorneys often set policies. Uh, most will have some crime that they are targeting or and not necessarily targeting, but something that they campaigned on that they want to fix. And that is going to vary jurisdiction by jurisdiction. What about the hired attorneys? How are they? How are they selected? Assistant prosecuting attorneys, either assistant DAs or assistant county attorneys. This is your this is your worker B attorneys. Okay, this is a hands-on position. Um, typically, you will have lower. They will have a lower salary than say some of your private firms. However. It's a really good experience for attorneys coming right out of law school because they get trial experience. And not only that, um, a lot of them use it to kind of springboard into political careers. But I would say even if the pay tends to be less than the private sector, they don't work the same days that the private sector does. Um, having Being a government employee like a state prosecutor has its advantages. Uh, these prosecutors have the same holiday schedule as whatever government entity they are working for. And typically government workers tend to have pretty good retirements as opposed to a lot of people in the private sector have a 401k and they really only get what they put in. For instance, the El Paso district attorneys and really if any county employee, including um, you know, the sheriff's office, uh, those that work for the hospital district, they are members of the Texas District and County Retirement System. And whatever money they put into that system, the system matches two and a half times. So a person is guaranteed a set retirement based on their years of service and the amount of money that was matched. So it really, even though they get less than they would salary wise than the private sector, it really is a very stable and I, I don't want to say lucrative, but it, it can be. Um, most government jobs have a have a pay scale and they have a they have step increases that a person is eligible for every year assuming assuming you know there's um, no freeze in the budget or anything like that for the government. But um, it is a pretty steady and reliable position, at least in terms of employment. Let's talk about the organization and operation of the prosecutor's office. There are different models of prosecution. So in the horizontal model, think of kind of like a conveyor belt. Certain people do certain things. So for instance, when I worked at the district attorney's office, it was more of a horizontal model for most cases. You had what was called the intake unit and the intake unit received the reports from law enforcement and the, the attorneys in the intake unit decided what kind of crime they were gonna charge. So if something came in that could have been an assault, could have been an ag assault, they were the ones that decided, do I wanna charge this as a misdemeanor or do I wanna take it to the grand jury and see if the grand jury will indict on a felony? From there, once the case was either indicted or charged as a misdemeanor, indicted as a felony or charged as a misdemeanor, it then went to attorneys who were in the various courts. And those attorneys handled the guilt innocence phase. So they would handle the all the pretrial and trial matters. Then if a case was appealed, there it was an appellate section and the attorneys in the appellate section would handle any kind of post-trial writs or appeals. Okay, that's the horizontal model. The vertical model is where one prosecutor sticks with the case and they follow it from intake where they accept it and charge it all the way through appeals. Now, when I worked at the county attorney's office in the juvenile unit, uh, there were many times that it was more of a vertical model because I would come across a case that I charged and then I tried it. 
And then if I tried it and it was appealed, I definitely wanted to write the appeal. And so that's an example of vertical prosecution. And then some have a mixed model where you get elements of both. Is, is one better than the other? Well, I think there are arguments for and against. In the horizontal, in the horizontal model, uh, an attorney really gets to be specialized. And let's say they're only handling a certain kind of case in the courtroom. They get to be very, very good at what they do. But on the other hand, um, I think that as an attorney, if, if you're going to charge a case and you're going to charge someone with a crime, you probably should know how to try a case because you know what kind of evidence will work in front of a jury and which won't. So I think it makes you better able to determine, hey, maybe I should charge this um, you know, as a felony. I think we have the evidence. Or you know, maybe there's just not enough evidence in this case and we shouldn't charge it at all. So what are some of the prosecutor's duties? Uh, there are some non-prosecutorial duties. Um, sometimes they are asked for legal assistance and advice. I, your book talks about juvenile and dependency matters, but juvenile crime here in Texas is prosecuted, so I'm not sure I agree with that. Uh, child support enforcement, some, t some district attorney's office handle child support enforcement. Uh, victim's assistance, victim assistance goes hand in hand with prosecution because most, most prosecutor's offices have victim's assistance departments and their whole job really and it's not you know sometimes the prosecutor helps but more often than not it's persons that are assigned to that victim assistance unit and their whole job is to help the victim you know not only prepare for what is going to be needed from the victim should the case go to trial you know and prepping to be a witness but also the services that are available to a victim. So counseling services. Texas also has what's called the Victim Impact Fund and victim, or excuse me, the Crime, Crime Compensation Fund. Victims can apply to that state fund and they can have certain things paid for. Uh, certain restitution, if they had to move because of what occurred, if they have to travel back for trial, that can be paid for. Um, there's all sorts of things, up to and including housing, utilities, things like that. There's also something called civil asset forfeitures. Um, anytime someone commits a crime, and let's, the easiest example I can think of is someone who is running drugs. If you're running drugs, that's an illegal enterprise. You're not allowed to make money by committing crime. So any kind of money that the person made from conducting illegal activity, all of that can be seized by law enforcement and by the prosecution. So houses, vehicles, uh, bank accounts, anything like that can be taken. And that's what's called civil asset forfeiture. What are some prosecutorial duties? Well, they have to adjudicate criminal matters. So they have to, they have to handle the cases. And what does that mean? Well, from the moment a person is arrested all the way through prison. So any pretrial motions. Um, in some instances, like for instance here in El Paso, El Paso District Attorney's Office has a program called DIMS. And what DIMS does is it has an assistant district attorney available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. And that, whoever is on duty, um, police can call the prosecutor and say, hey, here's our case. And they'll give them a summary of the case and the evidence they have. Do you want to charge it? And if the prosecution feels that there's enough evidence to charge, they will charge the person right then and there and accept it. Now, if it's a felony, obviously it has to go to grand jury, but the, but the prosecutor can still accept the case for, for the prosecuting office, and they often recommend a certain bond amount. And so it's, um, 
it's a good program. It helps speed things up in terms of, you know, getting the case from law enforcement to the prosecution. Uh, they can assist law enforcement officers. Many prosecutors' offices, especially prosecutors that handle major crimes, such as sexual assaults, murders, they get to know their detectives. And anytime there's a major crime scene or a major crime, prosecutors can be called out to the crime scene to assist with law enforcement. Okay. And they also help manage the investigation. Other times prosecutors get called out is you know, for sexual assaults. Sometimes there's a child victim and the child needs to be interviewed in what's called a forensic exam. So the prosecutor will meet with the detective and the detective and the prosecutor will usually through like a, like a two-way mirror sit behind in this little room and listen to the forensic interviewer interview the child and the prosecutor and the detective will confer and then speak to the forensic interviewer and, and let them know if there's any other questions they need to ask. And the prosecutor can usually make a determination right then and there. Yes, there's enough, um, there's enough for us to charge or no, there's not. Your book lists a pretty good list of what prosecutors have to do. So before an arrest, advise law enforcement, help prepare for the arrest and search warrants, and work with law enforcement in developing cooperating witnesses. After the arrest, everything we have just discussed, screen cases, make charging decisions, take it to the grand jury, um, sometimes prepare charging documents, uh, unless, you know, if they don't have a secretary or paralegal to do that. Uh, they have to prepare and respond to motions, uh, oversee continued investigations, ask for evidence, interview witnesses. Um, they do all of these things. What are some other ones? Let's talk about charging decisions. Whether or not to charge a crime is a tremendous power. And a prosecutor has quite a bit of discretion in doing so. The Supreme Court has pretty much said, we don't really review whether or not a prosecutor decides to charge a case or not. Okay, now, so how is a prosecutor bound? Really, a prosecutor is bound by ethics. Last week, you had to look at the professional responsibilities of attorneys. Okay, and so for prosecutors, they have to have sufficient evidence. What does that mean? They have to have what's called a scintilla of evidence. They have to have evidence of each and every element of the offense. It doesn't have to be great evidence, but they have to have enough that they could take it to a jury. And they also don't have to have a reason to not charge. Uh, prosecutors cannot charge cases all the time. You, you know, and you really don't want them to. You know, I'm not sure how many of you grew up with siblings, but how many of you got into a fight with your sibling? And maybe you started it. Maybe you punched your brother or sister. Well, let's say you did so when you were 10 years old. At 10 years old, you are eligible if you commit a crime to be detained in the juvenile system and charged in the juvenile system. So should we... Should we arrest and detain every 10 year old who punches his you know, 12 year old brother? Probably not. Okay, so there are some reasons why we have discretion. What goes into a charging decision? You know, how do prosecutors make the call? Do they flip a coin? What do they do? Well, there are three key factors. They look at the offense seriousness. How serious is the offense? They also look at offender's culpability. How likely is it that the offender committed the crime? And what is the likelihood of conviction? Now, I know we've talked a little bit about must, you know, prosecutors have a duty to see that justice is done, not to seek convictions. But prosecutors do have to look at, is it possible for a jury to convict? Because if there's no way a jury could convict someone, why would a prosecutor charge it? It would make absolutely no sense because it would pretty much be a waste of everyone's time. And 
you're charging something that you don't think would ever would ever lead to a conviction. Why put the defendant through that? Why take the time away from other cases that need to be tried? Your book also has another good list of prosecutor duties. I would check that out. What else do prosecutors have to do? Well, they have plea bargaining duties. I don't know if any of you have ever gone to the swap meet, but you kind of haggle over prices. That's kind of like plea bargaining. You know, prosecutors will have an idea in their head of what they think the appropriate punishment is for um, whatever case they're planning to plea bargain. And it becomes kind of a haggle with the defense attorney. On For state prosecution, adult state prosecution, you can plea bargain using the different um, punishment elements. Are they going to be on probation? Are they going to go to prison? How much time? So you can negotiate on that. Um, you can negotiate on the terms and conditions of probation. You know, are they supposed to attend certain classes? How many hours of community service? Uh, the amount of fine they're supposed to pay. Okay, and they're, they're re it really, the prosecutor really has a lot of discretion here. You know, some prosecutors have their pet peeve crimes where they are not really going to negotiate much. Other times, the head of the prosecuting office, if it's a state, it'll be the district attorney or county attorney, the elected, will have rules. You know, for like, for instance, for a while here in El Paso, there was a zero tolerance policy for family violence assaults. So if someone was charged with family violence, there was no dismissal. It The person either pled or it went to trial. And the assistant district attorneys didn't really have much discretion because their boss told them this is what you are going to do. You know, often, and then also there's sometimes a going right. You know, there are kind of standards that are put in place. You know, a, a DWI first, you know, if the person took the breathalyzer and he wasn't too far over the legal limit, you know, maybe those people are always going to be eligible for pretrial diversion. Or, you know, if it's a certain crime, they're going to be offered X punishment. Um, why do that? Well, it's going to help with a couple things. It's going to hopefully end uh, prosecutor shopping because defense attorneys will start to realize who's more lenient and they'll just hopefully wait and try and get a certain prosecutor or try and get it transferred out of that prosecutor's court. So having some standards is a good thing. What are some other duties? Well, they have to disclose evidence. Anything, prosecution, most, let me back up. Most courts have a discovery order and that discovery order pretty much says you will give the defense attorney access to everything you have. And even if there is no formal discovery order, a prosecutor should do that anyway. The, the defendant is entitled to know what the charges are against him and who will testify against him and what evidence there is. So prosecutors have to turn that over and they absolutely have to turn over any exculpatory evidence. We went over that last week when we talked about Brady evidence and it's anything that's favorable to the defendant. If it might show that the defendant didn't do it, you better turn it over. They also have to turn over impeachment evidence. So anytime the prosecution has a witness whose credibility could be attacked, they have to tell the defense attorney, hey, my witness has some credibility issues. If they don't disclose, that could lead to issues not only for the case, but also for the prosecutor. So prosecutors, because there are so many cases, and really, cases on average prior to COVID took about a year to a year and a half to get resolved from arrest to either plea or trial. You know, they, they take a little while. With COVID, things have slowed down quite a bit. So it's taking even longer. So how do they rapidly dispose of cases? 
Well, the courtroom work group tries to get kind of an assembly line process going. The prosecutor has a lot of discretion to negotiate plea bargains, and the court helps to manage the case flow. Uh, the court coordinator and the judge will set um, different hearings, and they expect parties to be ready for those hearings. And there also is a, is a sense that everybody wants to work together because you know the defense attorney wants to get the best possible deal for his client and the prosecution wants to ensure that justice is done and the court is wanting to move things along so that there is i guess a speedy disposition for the cases let's talk about the expansion of prosecutorial discretionary power there's been a little First, we had mandatory sentencing laws. Okay, so that, that increased prosecutorial discretion because if there's a mandatory sentence, the prosecutor said, well, do we charge this? And what crime are we gonna charge? So you've heard of the three strikes you're out. So after three felonies, you're looking at a mandatory 25 here in Texas if convicted. Maybe does the prosecutor want to go that route? Is it one of those cases that could be a misdemeanor or a felony, you know, depending on how the prosecutor charged it? So do they want to charge it as a felony to get that mandatory sentence? Or do they think the crime isn't deserving of a mandatory sentence, so they might charge it as a misdemeanor? For the judges, it decreased judicial discretion because it told the judges this is what is going to happen. This is the mandatory sentence. Let's talk about prosecutorial ethics and misconduct. Now, our system is an adversarial system. It's, I'm not going to say it's like a game, like a sporting event, but there are, there's definitely one side against the other. And in this case, it's the prosecution versus the defense. Only one of them can win. If the prosecution wins, the defendant's found guilty. If the defense wins, the defendant is found not guilty. So only one of them is going to win. Now, sometimes is there a mistrial and you got to do it over again? Sure. But really, only one side's going to win. And prosecutors, Prosecutors, though, have a duty to seek justice. In Texas, it's the duty to see that justice is done. They're not there just to convict, and they certainly don't want to wrongfully convict someone. Okay, they definitely do not. Now, do some prosecutors get so caught up in winning that they lose sight of justice? Yes, and there's been elected prosecutors that have done that. You know, I can think of a couple that have come to mind that has made the national news and they lost their license to practice law. So what happens when a good prosecutor goes bad? Well, we call that prosecutorial misconduct. Any kind of prosecutorial misconduct is a breach of ethical duty. So you looked last week at the Code of Professional Responsibility and there are certain duties that attorneys have and prosecutors are held to an even higher standard. Why? Because they have a lot of discretion and having a lot of discretion means they have a lot of power over the people they are prosecuting. And so a person that has that kind of power has to be ethical. You know, think about it. Would you have wanted, you know, Darth Vader and not Darth Vader when he died, but Darth Vader like in Star Wars, the original one, would you have wanted him as your prosecutor? No, I'd say probably not. You know, not the best uh, ethics. Okay, I know I digressed and I kind of kidded there, but let's talk about some kinds of misconduct. There's courtroom misconduct. You know, doing things just to inflame the jury, trying to get evidence before the jury even though it hasn't been properly admitted. Evidence or witness tampering, trying to tell a witness what to say on the stand. You know, when I was always preparing a witness, the last thing I ever wanted to be confused or accused of is telling the witness what to say. And so I was always very clear with my witnesses. When someone asks you a question, whether it's me or the defense attorney, 
If you don't understand the question, please ask for them to clarify it. But always answer truthfully. And sometimes the, the correct, the truthful answer is, I don't know. You know, if they never knew it, then the correct answer is, I don't know. If they don't remember it, then the correct answer is, I don't remember. Okay, but it was always, I always felt it was very important to emphasize that they have to tell the truth. Because the juror, you know, it's, they're, they're on the stand and they're under oath and they could be prosecuted for lying under oath. And not only that, juries can tell when you're lying, when someone's lying to them. And so it was always very important to tell the truth. Prosecutors can also commit um, prosecutorial misconduct by harassing people or bias, like maybe they don't like a certain person and they try to find some way to prosecute them. The best example I can give you is uh, Billions. If you haven't seen that, um, really, really good show. And of course, the actors' names will not come to mind right now, but it's about a, an elected U.S. attorney in, at least when the series starts out, in one of the districts, federal districts in New York. And his wife is a psychiatrist who works for like a hedge fund owner. And um, he's very jealous of that guy. The, the hedge fund guy is Bobby Axelrod. But anyway, the prosecutor uses all of his power and influence to try and prosecute uh, Bobby Axelrod. Anyway, it's a good show. You should watch it if you have it. I'll stop uh, talking about movies now and uh, TV shows. All right, They're, they can also be, um, they can also get in trouble for improper behavior and, you know, any other violation of any of their ethical duties. What happens to them if they violate? Well, sanctions. If the misconduct is unintentional, meaning they didn't mean to do it, they probably won't be sanctioned and sanctioned can be fined or punished. What? you know, whichever the judge prefers or both. Um, and if the outcome isn't affected, then probably they'll just be told, hey, you need to be more careful next time. Intentional misconduct, meaning they did it on purpose. Most of the time, it's going to result in a reversal of the conviction and it can result in disciplinary action. Okay, and by disciplinary action, um, if, it's, if it's bad enough, they could lose their license to practice law and never get to be an attorney again. And in some cases, they can even be prosecuted for a crime. All right, let's switch gears and talk about community prosecution. Community prosecution began in the 90s. And really, it was kind of this partnership between the prosecutor and law enforcement and community members. And it was for all three to get together and identify problems they saw in their communities and how they could fix them and have everybody work together to kind of fix these problems. Okay, and it was supposed to be less adversarial. You know, instead of just the police arresting people and sending it to the prosecutor and the prosecutor prosecuting them, this was really a way to create a dialogue and to try and solve things together. And there, it's been pretty successful in some places. You know, it used to identify and solve problems and enhance public safety and improve the quality of life in the community. And I'd say it's still, it still does to a certain degree. So there are five core elements of community prosecution. There, it's proactive. So people are really trying to identify issues. It's targeted. They're saying, okay, we're gonna go after this problem. And how are we going to do that? They try and problem solve. How can we fix our targeted problem? And they do so by creating partnerships and they use a variety of methods to do so. So let's look at a couple. One is this prisoner reentry program in Albany, New York. Okay, so typically once a person is in the system and they're released, there's a high recidivism rate, meaning they're going to commit a crime. It's likely that they're going to commit a crime again. So how do they keep them from doing so? Well, they want to reintegrate them into the community. So this reintegration community had um, the RABs, the Reintegration Accountability Boards. And these were people 
that were citizens of the community and they would meet with the parolees and they would help them. They would help them find places to live, get them things to wear to job interviews and, you know, kind of help them out. You know, things might have changed in society since they were last in it and they wanted to include them in the community because what's what's the best way to get people to act right? Well, to get them to feel like they're a part of the community, to accept them. And so that's kind of how they did it in Albany. And it's been pretty successful. Another example is Wayne County, Michigan. This is uh, Detroit. So what what they did here is, and I'm not sure if you all are aware, but they're, Detroit has a massive problem with abandoned buildings and homes. And a lot of those abandoned properties become you know, kind of used for shady activities, you know, prostitution, drugs, things like that. And so what uh, they started doing is targeting these people that allowed these properties to just dilapidate. And, and the state would, you know, tell the owner, you need to fix it up and turn it around. Otherwise, we're going to take it from you. We're going to condemn it and take it. And so that's what they started doing. The the landlord or the property owner either had to fix up their property and get all of the crime out of there, or it was taken from them and it was either torn down or torn, turned into community centers. Um, but either way, it um, helped improve the community. This really, you know, kind of goes to the broken window theory, which I'm sure you've heard ad nauseum in other CJ classes. And I can tell you here in El Paso, um, the county attorney's office is doing just that. So you've probably seen on the news the massage parlors that are being shut down because they're actually fronts for prostitution and human trafficking. So that is, you know, one thing that uh, is a problem here in El Paso, and that's the county attorney's office community prosecution effort. Uh, years ago, there was also one with graffiti and other like problems. Ladies and gentlemen, that's all I have for you. So I hope you all have a great rest of your day or evening whenever you're listening to this. Talk to you next time.